So let's uh, finish up our story here looking at a quantum mechanical description of a bond using valence bond theory. Um, let's pick up on this idea of the formation of pi bonds that we find come when we have unhybridized p orbitals with unpaired electrons and how that has implications for the shape and features like uh, rotation. So if we're using valence bond theory, we want to start with a uh, Lewis structure. Uh, I know that's a skill that we have. Once we have that, we can then look at a given atom, determine the electron domain geometry. Once we know the electron domain geometry, we can quickly say, okay, I know what the um, hybridization would look like. So in this case, I see a carbon atom, two electron domains, linear arrangement, that's going to be sp hybridized. I'll have two sp hybrid orbitals. How will that then account for the bonding? So the two sp hybrid orbitals will contribute to a sigma bond with the hydrogen atom, a sigma bond as it overlaps with the sp on the other carbon. In both cases, what do I have left over? Carbon atom within the mixing is combined in an s orbital with a p orbital, and I have two p orbitals remaining, up and down, front to back. That would be true on both of the carbon atoms. That's what will allow me to have the overlap that leads to the pi bonds. So for a given carbon atom, four valence electrons, I would see two of the electrons in sp hybrid orbitals, two of them that are remaining in p orbitals that are unhybridized. Those have the orientation, again, up and down, front to back. That's what leads to the overlap to form the carbon-carbon pi bonds. Let's look at another aspect of having the orbitals overlap. So let's look here um, when we're looking at uh, resonance structures in benzene. So we see within benzene we have um, this pattern of double bonds where we can keep the atoms in the same location, flip where the electrons are, and have the double bonds then be in the alternating pattern. If we can do that, we're going to be describing resonance structures which are combining both of these. So initially, let's look at a carbon atom. I see three electron domains. Three electron domains tells me it's going to be planar, and I'm going to need sp2 hybridized. So the first step would be to account for the sigma bonds. In each case, then I have a leftover p orbital that's perpendicular to that plane. Each of these has a uh, unpaired electron. That's what's going to lead to then the pi bond. I could consider it to be localized, which would mean uh, distinct pi bonds and sigma bonds, but I've got this alternating pattern. So remember with resonance, we don't have a back and forth between these. We're combining them. So that's leading to what we're calling a delocalized pi bond, where we'd have this feature where the electron density could be universally above, below the plane. That's how we're using valence bond theory to account for a resonance structure with delocalized pi bonds. We'll look at that a little bit more when we get to molecular orbital theory. But this is a powerful way to think about it using valence bond theory. Another aspect I want to bring home with valence bond theory, let's consider a molecule like this, H2C3H2. I think now we can really do a complete treatment using valence bond theory. We can consider the geometry, the hybridization, what are the bond angles, tell me about the sigma and pi bonds, where are they coming from. This would be Great, great kind of molecule to be able to explore all of those ideas. So we would begin with the Lewis structure. We could consider then the hybridization for each of these. An initial estimate, we have a sense of the bond angles using Vesper. Within this one, we're looking more closely to say, okay, for those carbon atoms, because that's where the story is, what is their initial hybridization? Sp2 for each of the ones on the outside. SP in the center to explain the linear um, geometry, electron domain geometry. Another feature I want to add within here is, let's see the shape of this. As it's drawn right here, it, a Lewis structure, remember, it doesn't really tell me the geometry. It looks like they're all in the same plane. Maybe there's some ability to account for a bond angle. Let's look more closely. So I like this, uh, this website. Uh, it's called ChemTube3D where you can look and see how we're constructing the different um, bonding orbitals. So in this first one, it explores it using valence bond. So a feature that I want to add within here is, look at the central atom. The central atom was sp, so that gave me 
a sigma bond towards one carbon, a sigma bond towards the other. Two unhybridized p orbitals remain, they would be 90 degrees to each other. So if I think about then the p orbitals on one of the external carbons, I can have that arranged in a line so it overlaps with the p orbitals on the central atom. But now if I have them overlap with the p orbitals on the central atom, in this case with the up and down ones, I've already used those up. I would have then the other ones that would be making use of the ones that are 90 degrees to that. So notice within this one, this is telling me something about the alignment. I'm restricting the rotation for sure, but I'm also, and I think I can add here what it looks like to have a pi bond form. I'm also adjusting what the alignment is. That's what is shown in this image right here. How when I have consecutive double bonds, they end up being 90 degrees to each other. When I had the every other case that would lead to resonance, we saw that they were all in the same plane. I really like within this, uh, this website where you can explore other molecules. Some of the molecules within here are ex um, explained using valence bond theory. Other ones use a description, allows you to explore uh, molecular orbital theory. It's a uh, fun and useful website, I think, because it allows you to build the molecules up in stages. So within this one, I think we have a, a really complete picture. Valence bond theory is really a, a great approach for describing a molecule like this, and we get insights, many different insights into the structure. Now, I mentioned molecular orbital theory. That's the other quantum mechanical description that we're interested in using. So within this case, we're going to begin with atomic orbitals, considering their wave function and an electron configuration. And we're going to then combine that with the idea of constructive and destructive interference for these wave functions. That'll take us to molecular orbitals. So we're going to be making new molecular or orbitals. Notice we are not having a hybridization stage. We're taking the atomic orbitals that we initially have, and we're constructing something new. M orbitals that are a description for the molecule itself. Those are our molecular orbitals. We're going to describe those as being in characteristics of bonding or a new idea anti-bonding. Our notation, we have sigma and pi, same as before, but we also have that sigma star, pi star, which refers to uh, the anti-bonding. We're going to consider their energy levels in the kinds of um, uh, molecules that we're going to look at, generally diatomic ones. The kinds of things that we will use when we populate those energy levels, the kinds of properties we'll explore, some of those we've been already thinking about, things like bond order and bond length, but we'll add a new one to the mix, which is magnetism. So here's an image from Atkins describing uh, the formation of molecular orbitals. A lot going on with an image like this. Let's see if we can understand that, because he goes from an image like that to these ones that seem even more far-fetched. There's a lot going on within these different representations. Let's see if we can begin to uh, understand what's going on. So let's start with our simplest one. Let's look at the bonding in H2. So we're going to say that molecular orbitals are formed when the atomic orbitals, as waves, interfere. We can consider both a constructive and a destructive interference. And when I say consider both constructive and destructive, we're going to be uh, taking linear combinations of these atomic orbitals. And there's two different ways that we can combine them. This one at the bottom is leading to the arrangement that is bonding. So it's bringing together the wave functions. That's what the red line is for each nuclei. It's seeing how then they combine to give this overall blue profile for the new wave function for the molecular orbital. This is a bonding arrangement. This is lower in energy than the atomic orbitals when they're all by themselves, separate from each other. What would lead to this? Well, I have the same idea that there's attractions between the electrons in both nuclei. So when it's an electron's in this region between, it could be attracted to both nuclei. An important factor that we can also discuss is that a given electron now is in a larger volume. We've increased the space where that electron can be found. Think back to our particle in the box. If we increase the length of the box, the kinetic energy went down. 
this is an important feature to explain the bonding. In fact, if I only think about the idea that the electrons are attracted to both nuclei, it doesn't work. It's not sufficient to explain why a bond would form, a covalent bond would form. I need to add to it this idea that there's a lowering in the kinetic energy as well. This is an idea that I like that we can include in this class, but I struggle to include within my uh, other general chemistry course because we haven't talked about a particle in a box. But in this case, this is a really, I think, interesting application for how that gives rise to an important feature, which is our covalent bonding. If I were to bring them together and I have the other linear combination, if we want to think of the wave functions as having different phases, notice one is down when the other one is up. If I were to combine both of those, now notice I have a node in between. I have a region where I don't have any electron density. This would be my anti-bonding description. That's what's showing up within this image. How we have initially on the left and right the atomic orbitals, the bonding is lower in energy, the antibonding is higher. One thing if you look closely, the antibonding is being raised more than the bonding is lowering. So if you were to have electrons populating all of these, it's not that you break even and the atoms would just sit at that position perhaps. No, it would be net repulsive because what you're doing after all is you're bringing the nuclei close together, but you're saying, Electron density, the spot where I could have an attraction between both, okay, you can't have the electrons found in that spot. So that's why net, the net, the net uh, energy for an antibonding is even more uh, repulsive than the bonding is uh, advantageous. Here's another image of the same thing. So I'm trying to show that as you're bringing together the atoms, you could have a case where the phases match or where the phases are opposite from each other. When they're matching up we see this constructive overlap resulting in overall bonding it is sigma because the electron density is along the internuclear axis if we bring them together and the phases are opposite from each other that's leading to a node in between and that's what the star indicates the anti-bonding the sigma star so we bring them together and make a bonding and an anti-bonding for h2 i see that i have a total of two electrons that's what I'm going to add, and they both go into this bonding molecular orbital. So here's the picture, the same kind of thing. I've got in H2, two electrons. Plop them both in here into the bonding molecular orbital. The way I'd analyze this, then, I, I can think about the bond order. My math for that is I'm going to add up the bonding electrons minus the anti, cut that in half. So this is a long way to take us to what we already know, which is an H2 the bond ordered is one. It's a single bond. I'm also within this image. Notice I've made the atomic orbitals vanish away. Because what I'm trying to say is that once we've constructed our molecular orbitals, we're no longer thinking about the atomic orbitals. We're thinking about the orbitals from the molecule itself. If I were to think about an H2 minus anion, I have a next electron, add an electron. Where does it go? Into the next energy level. It's anti-bonding in that case, so this leads to a bond order of one half. Now, how do I sort of visualize this? What do I think is going on? Well, first of all, a bond order of one half. Do I think that can exist? Yes, that's just describing a weaker bond than what a bond order of one would be. We've already been, been encountering fractional bond orders. This is another fractional bond order. Now, how I would sort of visualize what's going on mentally, imagine we have the two nuclei close together with one electron, I would begin to see some electron density between the two. Adding a second electron, I have now had greater electron density. I'm forming a sigma bond with electron density found uh, along the internuclear axis. I add another electron to the mix. So mentally what I'm seeing now is I'm, I'm beginning to have an anti-bonding contribution. So I'm visualizing, okay, now the electron density is diminishing in that space in between, in the spot where I have a node. If I were to add yet another electron, okay, that electron, electron density in between is now gone. So I'm visualizing this building up and then decrease in stages. So that's our plan. So now the next task is let's just explore and see the other energy levels. So we had lower in energy is the 1s, next comes the 2s, same kind of plan. We have a little bit more of interest here when we're looking at things within the 2p. We have 2p overlapping with another 2p. 
it's more diverse here because we have different p orbitals. First thought is within these that are forming sigma and sigma star, electron densities along the internuclear axes, it's showing how the phases can match up in between leading to greater electron density, or they can um, be different from each other and that puts a node in between. So within Atkins's picture here, the black dots are the different nuclei and we're seeing electron density between or the presence of nodes. To my own eye as I look at these, uh, I know what he's trying to show with this image. I make better sense from this bottom one. The bottom one here with the pluses and minuses allows me in my own head to see more clearly what does it mean to have constructive interference or destructive. This is given the sigma notation because it's along the internuclear axis. Even if we have nodes, it's still along that axis. For the pi one, those are formed from the p orbitals that are off the axis, either above and below or front to back. In both of those cases, we can now have ones that lead to constructive interference with electron density now found above and below, or destructive where we have a node in between. And because we have two different examples here for these off-axis ones, they're degenerate. That's why we see di two different boxes there in our orbital diagram. So here's as we progress across our second row for the elements that would be forming diatomics on the left-hand side and then on the right-hand side. Very similar in terms of what happens with the 1s, the 2s. We just have a slight difference here within the 2p. In both cases, cases, once we know the ordering, we're just going to fill them up using the building up principle. Same kind of thing that we uh, have done when we were looking at atomic orbitals. The slight difference within here, notice is the ordering between the pi and the sigma for the elements on the left hand side versus those on the right. A lot of times students have a question, well, why is this taking place? Well, think about what we're doing within our, our approach here. We are saying you have atomic orbitals. The simplest way to consider them is to consider how one atomic orbital on one atom overlaps with the atomic orbital that has that same orientation on the other. We looked at them independently. First thought is, that's our simplest approach, but that simplification is not always appropriate. Because what does it mean to say that, okay, I'm going to ignore all of the other orbitals and only consider one with how it overlaps with the other to form a molecular orbital? It's more complex than that. That's why Atkins says it's hard to predict without detailed calculations where these orbitals will lie. And as it turns out, this is how they are in the figure. We've already encountered that somewhat when we were first looking at electron configurations. If you recall, we had anomalous electron configurations. We had an initial sense for what we thought the ordering would be, but as we then encountered, as we added electrons to it, electrons interacting with other electrons, it led to a shifting of the energy levels. We didn't stress about that. We said, okay, that is the resulting electron configuration I get after accounting for that kind of variation. Same thing here. We're just saying that if you look more closely, a more detailed analysis describes this as what we have. So if we were to apply that then for things like N2 and O2, we're just going to say, okay, what are the energy levels? Let's fill them up. This is where it takes me for N2. Now notice, do I have the uh, sigma 1s and the sigma 1s star? I do, but I have the same number of the bonding and the antibonding. Net bonding there, it's not contributing. It's another way of thinking about how Okay, the bonding, we're going to be interested in the valence electrons. Can you do the math for the inner electrons? You can, but it's not really part of our story. So for N2, I've got sigma, sigma star. Then I have within the um, pi and sigma coming from the 2p, I see a total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 electrons. They're all in bonding. Cut that in half. This is how N2 um, it's shown to have a triple bond using molecular orbital theory. If I do the same thing for O2, do my analysis, I end up finding that it's a double bond. Now, let's compare and look a little bit more closely at this and how this compares with the previous uh, bonds that we were making in something like valence bond. In N2, I think that this has led me to say I have a sigma bond with two electrons. 
a pi bond and another pi bond, each holding two electrons. That is leading me to have a bond order of three. What do I see over here on O2? I see that I've begun to construct and put electron density into a sigma bond coming from the 2p. I've now populated the pi 2p, and then I'm adding electrons that are antibonding. This is back to my image of I was initially building up electron density, and now I'm visualizing that as it's being diminished. So this is actually leading to a really cool description. It's not the case of the double bond being both electrons in the same single p orbital that is overlapping with another one. It's combining both. It is saying that you have electron density found in both of the p orbitals that are overlapping with the pi, not just within a single one. And that that's what's leading to the um, overall description of a bond order of one coming from the pi bonds but in a way, it's one half and one half. That's a cool picture. So this would be the math here in when he's saying that um, uh, Atkins describes it as a sigma bond plus two half pi bonds taking place. If we were to apply that same idea, here's our energy diagrams. If we look at ones on the left-hand side of the periodic table and then on the right, as we fill them in with the different ordering, I'm sure a skill you have would be then to determine the bond order. Several of these are ones that we're familiar with. Triple bond in N2, double bond in O2, single bond in F2, wouldn't predict a bonding in neon 2. This one over here, like with carbon 2, that's something you probably haven't seen before. It's not a snippet of a molecule we necessarily encounter. But we're going to use the same kind of idea when we look at carbon in an extended solid. Let's say something like diamond. How would molecular orbital theory be relevant? So hang with me. This is not a molecule that we'll necessarily encounter, but we're going to use this idea later on as well. We can connect this readily to properties like the bond association energy and length. Notice as I go from a single to a double to a triple bond, the bond is getting shorter and shorter. The dissociation energy is going up, up, up. Another feature, though, it says whether it's paramagnetic or diamagnetic. That's its properties when it's placed within a magnetic field. Is it attracted to the magnetic field, meaning it's paramagnetic, or repulsed, which means it's diamagnetic? How do we explain that with these properties? That has to do with whether we have unpaired electrons. So if you have unpaired electrons, it looks like it's being labeled as paramagnetic. If I have all paired up electrons, it's diamagnetic. So if we were to analyze different molecules and anions like this, we could take the energy diagrams here, consider where the electrons are going to or coming from next, and it would lead us to say, okay, if I'm adding two more electrons to N2, it's going to be paramagnetic. O2 is initially paramagnetic, but if I add two more electrons, they end up getting paired up. This is a property you can readily measure. This is a great experiment where if you have the poles of a magnet, and you put in liquid O2 molecules, they get suspended in the magnet. Why? Back because they have unpaired electrons. This idea of unpaired electrons and explaining the magnetism of O2, that's a real achievement for molecular orbital theory. We didn't have that certainly in when we're drawing Lewis structures or valence bond, but it does emerge from the O when we treat O2 molecules within molecular orbital theory. And once again, remember what that takes us to. That takes us to the strange idea of how we are actually thinking of the pi bonds in this. Now, consider this one. So I've shown it uh, an energy diagram where I have two different atomic orbitals, but they're offset. If I told you one was, excuse me, one was hydrogen, one was helium, how would you assign them? So I would take us back to say, well, why would they have different potential ener energy values? We've already encountered that a little bit when we were looking at differences in effective nuclear charge for core electrons. And we found that when you have more protons, it's going to take that 1s energy level and just make it closer and closer to the nucleus. It keeps moving lower and lower in potential energy. So this is how I would match up the two. I would say that the potential energy is lower for the helium 1s because it has more protons. If I then seek to construct the molecular orbitals, I would still have a sigma and sigma star, 
if I were to populate them, I would say that I have two in the sigma, one in the sigma star. The sigma has somewhat greater, we would say, character of the helium, the one that has the atomic orbital that overlaps most closely in energy. The hydrogen would be contributing more to the antibonding. Sometimes we'll find that if we have quite differences in energy, they won't overlap. Even though the shape might be appropriate, they wouldn't overlap. So as we have more and more protons, it's not always the case that a 1s overlaps with a 1s. You could have an extreme case where maybe the 1s overlaps with a 2s. So we get a, a more and more shifting. So we have to consider both the energy and the orientation within this. So do I think something like this could exist? I think this has taken me to a bond order of 1 half. How about these? If I took helium and hydrogen and considered it as an anion or a cation, which of these would be more stable? We've got our profile. I think it would be the cation, because if I remove that from the antibonding, I'm back down to a single bond. So this, this is interesting. Could this ever exist? Where would this exist? Uh, there's research that suggests this is found in a spot where you have a lot of helium and hydrogen, which is the sun. Single bonds there would exist and form this particular cation. This idea here of looking at the relative contribution based on uh, the initial energy levels of the atomic orbitals, that's what Atkins is discussing here. Where instead of looking at homonuclear, he's looking at heteronuclear, different atoms that are still diatomics. And how we account for then aspects of bonds like whether it's a polar covalent, ionic or nonpolar, by accounting for differences in these um, in the sharing and how we can do that in molecular orbital theory as well. And that's where we're